have a chance to join us tonight. So uh, hello everyone, good evening and welcome to this uh, webinar as part of the Action Week Against Racism. My name is Nadej Milar and I'm a volunteer at Montréal Action. I act as the uh, marketing and communication uh, manager. So it's nice to meet everyone and thank you for being with us tonight. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen as I speak. Sorry about that, there you go. So before we get going, we just want to make uh, a land acknowledgement and uh, remind everyone that we are on unceded Indigenous land and that we keep working hard to pressure the city of Montreal to recognize that and to put it in the municipal charter because it's something that's really important for us at Montreal en Accent. Um, and before I let our amazing speaker take the floor, we just wanted to quickly introduce ourselves, who we are, Montréal en Action, and what we do in case you don't know us. Uh, so we were founded in 2017 by Balarama Homeless. We are a grassroots organization and movement that believe in mobilizing citizens around positive and social change. So we are a nonprofit organization that uses education and civic engagement to address key issues in society that are related to racism, diversity, inclusion, and uh, equity. So what we aim to do is to bring awareness and motivate people in becoming impactful social change maker within their community. And when we talk about community, it means of course, uh, the city of Montreal or the city you live in, but it can also be your group of, within your group of friends, within your family or your workplace. Um, and what started kind of our storyline at Montréal Maxon is what we did back in 2018. So we succeeded in collecting 22,000 signature, forcing the city of Montreal to hold a public consultation on systemic racism and discrimination. To those public discussion, more than 7,000 people came and shared their own experience relating to systemic discrimination. The result of those public discussions was a report that was written by the OCPM, uh, L'Office de Consultation Publique de Montréal. And that report was published uh, last summer, June 15, 2020. In that report, what you can find are 38 recommendations on how to fight systemic racism and discrimination in the city of Montreal. And those 38 recommendations tackle uh, multiple themes such as uh, employment, culture, racial and social profiling, indigenous rights, uh, et cetera. There's eight themes in total. So doing that was really a big accomplishment for us. And we became the first organization in North America to force a public consultation on systemic racism and discrimination at a municipal level. So that was quite a big accomplishment for us. And that's what we did from 2018 to 2020. So now that we're in 2021, uh, you might be wondering what, what it is that we're working on. Uh, well, what we're doing is working to hold the city accountable and make sure that those 38 recommendations are taken seriously and will be implemented. Because we truly believe that by implementing those recommendations, we'll be able to build a city that is more inclusive, equitable, and uh, sustainable. And how we do that is with the support of our volunteers, the support of our partners, and also with your support, with you being here tonight and showing up to all of our webinar and sharing our content on social, on social media and supporting us in all the way you can. So thanks a lot for being here tonight. I will now leave the floor to Julie, uh, who is also a volunteer at Montréal Maxon, and she will be introducing our speakers. Thank you so much, Nadej, and once again, welcome everyone to this webinar. So as we may have heard, um, Canada often presents itself as a tolerant multicultural society, but there's a long peculiarly Canadian history of racism and ongoing, and specifically Canadian manifestations of racial inequality today. So tonight, this webinar will also examine the impact of microaggression, racial gaslighting, and how it leads to race-based trauma with our three guests. So first, Sarah. Sarah is a Trudeau Foundation doctoral scholar at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law and a Fulbright visitor at Harvard Law School's Institute for Global Law and Policy. In winter 2021, she's teaching critical race theory and the law at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law. Sarah's thesis traces how people of the third world sought to address the novel problem of climate change with the decolonization era by matching a representation of nature with their aspiration to found a new international order that might achieve racial, 
political, cultural, and economic justice. For the future, Sarah is aiming to develop research connected to history, prepare justice, race, legal theories, the natural world, law reform, art, and international and domestic law. Next, we have Dr. Thompson. So Dr. Deborah Thompson is an Associate Professor of Political Science and Canada Research Chair in Racial Inequality in Democratic, in democratic Societies, a leading scholar of the comparative politics of race. Her research considers a relationship between race, the state, and inequality in Canada and beyond. She's currently writing a non-fiction book about the nuances of race, racism, and freedom, dreams across the Canada-US border, and an academic book on the global rise of Black Lives Matter. And finally, but not least, Dr. Sabrina Jafrali. As some of you may know, so Dr. Jafrali has led an impressive career as a secondary school teacher and university lecturer in her 20 years working in both the United Kingdom and in Canada. Her research includes teacher education, curriculum design, religious literature. Dr. Jafrali received her Master of Arts in Theological Studies from Concordia University and her PhD in teacher education from McGill University. In 2018, Dr. Jafrali received a Certificate of Achievement for the Prime Minister's Award for Teaching Excellence, but she also does substantial activism. As a matter of fact, in 2019, she was awarded with the Activist of the Year by Black.com. Recently, in 2021, Dr. Jafrali was also recognized as a Black changemaker in Quebec for continuous efforts in creating an equitable and inclusive society. Thank you for being here. Thank you much, so much for those uh, introductions. I'm absolutely delighted to be here with you all today. Uh, thank you for welcoming me. I'm so glad to engage with Montreal in Action and uh, my fellow panelists. Um, so the theme for our talk today is systemic racism connecting history to the present. And in my view, we can't have a discussion about systemic racism without talking about the, tradi the tradition of critical race theory, which identifies and grapples with the issue of systemic racism in a manner that ties the past to the present. So I'm going to begin our discussion today with a kind of primer, uh, a brief introduction to what critical race theory or CRT is and why it's important for understanding systemic racism and the possibilities for racial justice in Canada. CRT uh, has been referred to increasingly since the global uprisings in the spring of last year, in part because decision makers in the United States, including the former president, have banned the use of CRT for policy making. Why? How can CRT have such power that governments might seek to ban it? And why is foregrounding race through a CRT lens important? Critical race theory has been alternately called a social movement, an intellectual tradition, an analytical framework, a discourse, a language, among other things. And it may be all of these things at once. It has its origins in a social movement, the activist organizing of students and professors in the United States and Canada in the 1980s. It more or less began at Harvard Law School at that time when students, including Kimberly Crenshaw, who many of you will be familiar with for her crucial work on intersectionality, um, students, including uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, demanded that their school offer a course on how law and institutions affect race and how race affects law and institutions from a critical perspective. Now by critical, I don't mean to say criticism. These are different concepts. By critical, I mean to say a process of reflection that can unearth assumptions underlying laws, policies, and social practices in our everyday lives. When assumptions about race become taken for granted, they become almost real because they produce unjust consequences in our daily lives that are very material. And these consequences also accumulate over time and place such that racism becomes systemic a near structure that structures our relative precarity and security according to the color line as W.E.B. Du Bois called it. It's important to acknowledge that CRT was developed in law schools originally because it was all about the power that law has in society. If we aren't conscious of how race influences the law and vice versa, how can discrimination ever change? 
That said, CRT has traveled far beyond law schools. It's become a focal point to reflect upon racial assumptions underlying all manner of governance tools. For example, the administration of education, which I know we're gonna talk about a fair uh, bit today. Uh, we might think about the designation of who's an essential worker in the context of the pandemic and therefore exposed to COVID-19. Or we might think about uh, police brutality and the killing of black and indigenous peoples. In terms of the substance of CRT, beyond being a social movement, as I mentioned, we might think of it as an intellectual tradition, a language, a set of tools that can be used to identify precisely how racial assumptions operate. I mentioned intersectionality already, and many of you here today will know by now that people with intersectional identities of gender, sexuality, race, ability, class, and so on, have disparate access to privileges and suffer precarities in different ways. So if I were to give you an example, uh, in Canada, Black, Indigenous, and Asian women are vastly underrepresented in the academy. Another tenet of CRT is that race is a social construction. What that means is that race is not biological. It's not an essential part of our physical being. It's not based on genetics. And there's ample research to demonstrate this. Instead, race can be understood as a verb, as Derek Bell said. There are continuous processes of racialization or racing, according to which people with certain features, our skin, our hair, um, according to ancestry, geographic location, um, and other attributes are generally perceived by those in positions of dominance as subordinate. And these misconceptions about race can also be internalized by racialized peoples, about ourselves, and about other racialized peoples. So once again, returning to the law, um, the social construction of race can also be understood as the legal construction of race. And by this, I mean that government policies, laws, cases, and the like are not neutral and objective. They're political, they reflect biases, and they therefore actively construct people as racialized through the legal system. A final tool that CRT offers that's important for our discussion today is, to, is the focus on systemic racism, right? Hence the title of our, of our conversation. And what do I mean by this? Um, there are, of course, individuals who have biased views, whether conscious or unconscious, and their actions can be harmful. However, racism is not about a few bad apples. It's embedded in the very fabric of society, from the education system, to policing, to healthcare, to labor, to immigration, to many other areas, such that it has the feel of a structure. This pervasiveness of racism across institutions is how we might begin to understand this notion of systemic racism. Furthermore, we might flip the idea of racial subjugation to recognize that ideologies of white supremacy are systemic as well. And that ideologies of white supremacy translate into tangible privilege, right? Such as the privilege to move freely in the world without fear, to acquire and sell property more easily, to be considered desirable in hiring because of skewed notions of merit and the right fit. So what does CRT offer in terms of solutions then? For one thing, it offers this language to be able to identify problems such as intersectionality, the social and legal construction of race, systemic racism, as I've discussed. It also offers a forward-looking orientation toward racial justice using discourses of liberation, repair, or the unfinished business of emancipation. In particular, the scholar Mary Matsuda asks that we look to marginalized people solutions to racial injustices. And this requires a turn away from the viewpoint of governments, corporations, and people on the top toward a moral approach that honestly recognizes injustices in society and values the experiences of people who've been harmed to find solutions. I wanna to mention two other things uh, that are important for our discussion today. First, I wanna to touch on this theme of connecting history to the present. And in this respect, it's important to note that systemic racism is inseparable from systemic Systemic racism in the past. Here I'm referring to the ongoing legacies of colonialism, including the dispossession of Indigenous peoples for the appropriation by settlers of land, colonization elsewhere in Africa, Asia, the Pacific, and so on, and the legacies of the transatlantic slave trade. 
these forms of colonialism were justified by Europeans on the basis of race. And colonialism has fundamentally shaped the modern world. We can't think of a place like Haiti, for example, or Haitian people living in Montreal without recognizing how African people were forcibly moved to Haiti as enslaved persons. Present day migration across the world by people seeking a better life is an ongoing process of colonialism. And in places such as Canada, the founding of the nation state in the 19th century was based on the labor of Chinese people to build the Canadian Pacific Railway, the dispossession of indigenous lands, the enslavement of black and indigenous peoples, which happened not only in the United States, but happened here as well, and continuous population management through labor and immigration policies. These processes of racialization fundamentally underpin social perceptions of racialized people and the precarity that people continue to experience today. The last point I want to mention before turning to Professor Thompson uh, is about what's happening now. Resistance to systemic racism has always been present from small everyday acts of refusal to revolutions. And this kind of resistance uh, moves us beyond talking solely about critical race theory as I've done so far. Um, in Canada and the United States, there are ongoing protests led by the Movement for Black Lives or the Organization of Black Lives Matter, uh, as well as the Land Back Movement, and I'm sure you can think of others as well. And within institutions, the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is beginning to take hold to redress settler colonialism to the extent possible. And uh, more so, there has been a movement for establishing Black Studies programs across Canadian universities as well in order to capture the experience of Black people from wherever we hail. And this is translated into activities such as the funding of businesses, higher education, and the arts. I'm gonna end on that hopeful note uh, about what's being done, but I'd also like to acknowledge that, of course, we're far from reaching our destination um, or we wouldn't be having this conversation today. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Professor Thompson to make her remarks. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. That was a wonderful introduction. Um, so my name is Deb Thompson. I'm a professor here at McGill. Um, I'm going to talk pretty briefly um, about uh, systemic racism uh, a little bit. Um, I'm gonna build off of what Sarah began. So we know, of course, that Canada presents itself outwardly as being a multicultural and tolerant society. And part of the narrative that we tell ourselves as Canadians is that racism may have existed once upon a time, but it happened either a long time ago or it happened somewhere else. Uh, and most, most arguably the US, right? Canadians love to compare themselves to Americans. There is a racial logic to that. We can talk about that in the Q&A if you would like. Um, and we tend to think of racism, as Sarah said, about individual behaviors that are premised on giving some people an advantage and disadvantaging others, disadvantaging others because of their race. And in this formulation, racism is intentional. Anyone can be a perpetrator or a target. Um, and of course, this is not the whole story, right? It's, it's part of the story. Like, let's be clear, right? There are literal racists out there. Like there are, there are actual Nazis in, in 2020, mir miraculously in 2021, there are, there are Nazis out there. Um, there are also a lot of unintentional racists. And I believe Sabrina is gonna, gonna talk quite a bit about microaggressions and implicit bias. So let me leave that to the side. What I'd like to talk about is this, this other layer um, between the, the, the Nazis and the unintentional racists of, of the ways in which racism gets baked into our institutions and our social structures. In my mind, this is where racism is much more common. It's much more pervasive uh, and it's much harder to identify in part because as Charles Mills said, the, the fish can't see the water, right? Like white supremacy is the, is the water in which we're all swimming. It's really hard to see the ways that these structures um, exist and are highly consequential for our life outcomes. So racism is not a, a, just a function of individual attitudes. Let me give you like a really quick definition of racism that, uh, that I made up, uh, which you can do when you have a PhD apparently. Uh, so racism is the social, legal and economic and political distinctions that mark and maintain unequal entry and access points to privacy, property, protection, 
prosperity and personhood, right? Right, racism is embedded in our ideas, in our institutions, in our structures, um, especially uh, our ideologies that talk about hard work, about deservedness, about representation, redistribution, and even the proper roles of, of, of government. So when we talk about systemic racism, what we mean is that race, racism and racial bias get embedded in the ways that institutions operate. Like they, race and racism get embedded in the rules of the game, um, in norms and in patterns of behavior that work to perpetuate disadvantage for some racial groups and to give advantage to, to, to others. And so systemic racism is partially uh, because it's partially a function of the way that racial bias gets institutionalized in rules Right. If, if decision makers are, are quite powerful, then their biases become consequential uh, for many of us. Think about the, the biases that judges may, may have and, and the, the consequence of that for people um, in terms of, of their, their sentencing and, and access to parole and, and other things. Um, it's partially the way that seemingly universalistic and neutral rules actually affect different populations differently and therefore end up reifying existing inequalities which may have like their origins in, in other realms um, and it's partially that seemingly universalistic rules are actually designed to maintain inequality but become because racism is baked into our systems and our processes racism is self-perpetuating and I think that when I'm like when I talk to people in government agencies about systemic racism they frequently, tell me that like what systemic like racism, like the idea of, ra of systemic racism is that like there are racists in your system. And like, that's, that's not it, right? Systemic racism is that even if there were no racists in your system, you'd still see racially disparate outcomes, right? Because intentions don't matter. How, whether you're a good person doesn't matter. Whether your colleagues think they're good people doesn't matter. And doing nothing simply works to reinforce the racist status quo. Um, so let me give you like two really quick examples from my own life and my own work. I'm a professor uh, at, at a university. Um, and when we as, as faculty look to hire other professors or look to um, admit graduate students into our program, we like to think that we're not racist when we do that. And yet the things that we value when we evaluate like these candidates are exactly the same things that are likely to disadvantage racial minorities, right? Examples, SATs, if you're American, if you're not American, uh, the GRE, the LSAT, right? Standardized tests are notoriously racist. We know there's a ton of data on this that standardized tests are much more likely to measure your parents' level of income than they are your intelligence or your ability to succeed in graduate school, right? Um, we know here in, in, at McGill, we really value prestige, right? So we like it when our candidates come from places like Harvard, Princeton, or Yale. I can tell you having been at places like Harvard, Princeton, and Yale, they do not admit black students, right? And so like, if that is the pool of applicants that we are trying to get black faculty from, our, 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 our pool is already going to be skewed. Um, we value letters of re recommendation, and we know that letters of recommendation are saturated with racialized and gendered language. For example, we know that men are way more likely to be described as brilliant, and women are much more likely to be described as hardworking or, or empathetic or caring. Um, and of course, like this language has, has a result. We, when you value letters of recommendation, the language that's used to describe candidates also matters. Um, one final um, point is that it, here uh, in, in universities, we really, like, like many other industries, I imagine, we, we rely on our networks. Um, and anytime you rely on informal networks, that will always disadvantage the people that those networks were designed to exclude. Informalities always disadvantage racial minorities, sexual minorities, um, immigrants, anyone who doesn't have the connections um, that others might have. Another really quick example from my own life um, about um, the way that, that institutional and systemic racism works. Um, so I used to work at the University of Oregon and um, I was talking with the Dean of Students at one point 
And I had said to the Dean of Students, like, okay, if I have a Nazi in my class, because look, I was at the University of Oregon, there are legit Nazis in Oregon, like, no joke, they're on campus somewhere in my classes. And so, you know, talking to the Dean of Students, I said, if there is a Nazi in my class, and I feel unsafe, what, what should I do? What are my options? And she said, call campus police. And I said, that is not an option for me, right? One, because the University of Oregon campus police are racist. Um, two, we know that when police see an altercation between a black person and a white person, the black person is the one who ends up charged, arrested, or dead. Right. So I had said to so I said, look, this universalistic rule, which you think is fine for, for all faculty, is not okay for me as a woman of color, and particularly for me as a black woman. Right. And in fact, abiding by this seemingly neutral universalistic, universalistic rule is putting me in danger. So what other alternatives do you have? And she literally had never thought of this before, had never thought, right, that there might be people who don't want to call the police because the police put our lives in danger, right? So that's, not, that's an example of the ways in which like these rules seem as though they're universal and yet, and yet they're not, they're not universal. Um, one of, let me end with um, one of the, the comments, I, I do these kind of talks a lot and one of the comments I get, um, and it's not, I don't think it's pushback. I think that it's like genuine curiosity is like, look, we all grew up thinking believing that Canada is like a multicultural society. And I totally get that. I, you know, grew up in, in Oshawa, Ontario in the 1980s and 90s, and even in Oshawa, Ontario, where the black population was like 0.3%, right? It's very, very small. Canada, like people still believed in this multicultural ideal. Um, and so I wanna say like, yes, Canada is multicultural, of course, it is diverse. Um, something like 22% of the population identifies as a racial minority, um, but that means 78% of the population is white, and that is a predominantly white society, folks, um, by a long shot. Um, multiculturalism also hides a lot. Multiculturalism doesn't speak to anything like racial inequality, racism, discrimination, white supremacy. We also, of course, as Sarah mentioned, have a very long history of specifically Canadian racism racism in this country. There was slavery in this country for over 200 years. In fact, the Underground Railroad, which we cherish as being, you know, the, the most Canadian thing, right? We, we were a refuge for American refugees from slavery. And yet, most, well, all of the Northern United States abolished slavery long before Canada did. Right, Canada abolished slavery in 1833, 1834. The Northern states abolished slavery around the time of the revolution, which meant the Underground Railway used to go in the other direction. It was used to smuggle slaves out of Canada into the free Northern states. We know that there was, of course, a head tax on, on would-be Chinese immigrants. We know there was a white-only immigration policy that went well into the 1960s. In 1972, there were more visa offices in the greater London area of Great Britain than there were on the African continent. Um, in the 1981 census, Canada is still 96% white, right? Even as we're making these claims around multiculturalism, and we know that racialized Canadians had to deal with legalized segregation, were not given the right to vote, were not permitted to attend institutions of higher education. Um, and now in our contemporary times in 2021, there are racial disparities along any socioeconomic indicator that you can think of, right? As Sarah mentioned, health, education, sense of belonging, employment, wages, wealth, earning, incarceration, encounters with the police, and underrepresentation in any hall of government, including legislatures, the judiciary, the civil service, and corporate Canada, right? So name me an institution I, and I can tell you the ways in which it is highly racialized in this country. This is not just an American problem. This is homegrown, a Canadian problem. And maybe then it might require a very specifically Canadian solution. Um, and that's challenging in part because multiculturalism makes it, challenge, makes it harder to challenge racism where it exists. We first have to deal with our national dismissiveness around issues of race and racism, a refusal to acknowledge the realities of racism in this country, the fact that we do not collect racial data in, in terms of, of health 
or incarceration um, in ways that we can access. Um, and, and to take like the, these challenges seriously and begin to have more open, more honest, uh, more frank conversations uh, about the realities in this country. So let me end there and throw it over to Sabrina. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, and Sarah, Sarah and Deborah and Montreal en Action for the invitation. Actually, Sarah and Deborah actually set me up quite well uh, to talk about what I'm going to talk about because Sarah is talking about let's take any institution and examine it and see if we can find any um, non-racist issues. And I and I would I would totally agree with you, Deborah. There, right? Like a hundred percent. So. I want to bring our attention to one of those institutions that Deborah's talking about, which is education in school. And I want you to think about soil. And I often tell people, you have to think of school like planting. And you've got to ask yourself, what are we planting in our students? Because essentially, a system cannot maintain itself unless it's maintained by its citizens. And so when you go to school, you're laying the foundation of the very values that continue to perpetuate itself in a society, schools are micro or micro societies. And so in a school, you're reinforced, you're taught. Sometimes you're in a school where it can challenge, but essentially once you graduate and from high school or elementary, you're thrown into the grind of the bigger higher ed education. And so that value, that value challenging that you might've had in high school can disappear. And then you're back to the status quo. So I wanna talk about that because a lot of people think, well, I send my kids to school and they learn in education, but I'm here to tell you that education is not neutral. I've thought about it for many, many times, many, many days and years when I was writing my PhD. I would love to free education from governmental tentacles, I would call it. The government needs education, in fact, to reinforce its values. And Quebec is a perfect example. Uh, if you look at Quebec history curriculum, there is a reason why it continuously will oppose, including the narratives of Black Canadians, of Black Quebecois, of Asian Canadians, of Sikh Canadians, Sikh Quebecois, people who have been here many, many generations, and also paint Indigenous narratives that are unflattering, that look at them as disappearing, all for the cause of le vivre ensemble Quebecois. This is a problem. And so what it narrates for us is a value system that actually doesn't include us. It actually sends a message to young folks who are not Quebecois, who are not white, that you're okay if you work for us and pay taxes, but that's as much as you can go, right? And of course, let's not forget Bill 21 and the perpetuation of that injustice where I have to walk into a classroom and tell my students, uh, you're not just that Canadian, you're not just Canadian enough. So education is, is not neutral. In fact, I've argued that we should remove education from the hands from elected governments because they change every four years. But if we were to remove it from elected government officials, then the question is who would control the value train? Valerie, that value factory that we pump into kids and that they come out with. And that problem is like Deborah mentioned that that value system, that value train is not for us. It doesn't perpetuate values of equity. It doesn't perpetuate values of inclusivity. It doesn't perpetuate values of we are Canadian. I challenge all of you in this seminar to Google what does a Canadian look like? Google that. I will, I, you won't find me. You won't find Sarah. You won't find Deborah. You might find on page two and three some Indigenous family members, but you won't find a Canadian. So you won't find a Black Canadian. You won't find an Asian Canadian. You won't find us. So again, we're in a school system that's perpetuating a value system in a micro setting, preparing our students to understand the place that they want us to be in. And we see this in teachers all the time. I'm a teacher, I love my colleagues, but unless they have equity training, unless they understand what they are implanting in kids, in fact, what we're doing is preparing them for the slaughter of the inequities of their life that are, they're going to face. So for example, microaggressions, right? Microaggressions, if those of you who don't know today are these little subtle comments, they can be um, intentional, unintentional, intentional, a joke, but we often say, oh, well, Sabrina, you know, where are you really from? That six letter word really actually implies that I'm not Canadian enough or I came to Canada in a different way. 
when in fact, I go back many, many generations. But when you use the word really for a student, it implies an exclusivity and they don't belong. And we say, we say it all the time to students, oh, do you really mean that? Or do you really want to do that? Those implications when you use the word really as teachers are very harmful. And the one that we have no sort of equity training or framework or mental understanding. A lot of people wanna know, how do we do the work? How do we change? That work needs to be done in your mind first. You really need to address yourself first, especially in education when you are the value uh, inheritor. You're the one passing it on. You're the elder, so to speak. You're the one passing. So what happens after a while when a student begins to hear these microaggressions over and over? Well, maybe you should go into trades. Maybe this sage up's not for you. Oh, Marianopolis, maybe you can't afford it. These type of microaggressions that, you know, come off the tip of our tongue like it's nothing. A student might eventually gain the confidence to complain to someone, say, I'm not really happy when someone says that to me. And then we have another phenomenon that reinforces the value train, which is gaslighting. It's when we make people question their reality and their perception. And the one thing is you can do that as an adult. And as adults, we have a hard time with gaslighting. But when you do it as a kid and you're the authority figure, what you're really doing is really killing their soul a bit. And, and I wanna be honest with everybody in tonight's seminar, we've all gaslighted at some point. We've all said something like, maybe you're being too sensitive or maybe you should think about it in a different way or you know, don't worry, you won't be single forever. We've all gaslighted at some point. But when you become conscious of the gaslighting for students, it's a different impact. You know, when you start telling that student, maybe you're not taking it the right way, or maybe you're being too said, oh, it was just a joke. Maybe the teacher didn't mean it that way. In fact, what you're telling them is question your gut, suppress your feelings, just accept this gruel, value gruel that we're giving you. And just accept the fact that you're just not that Canadian enough. And that if you jump these hoops, maybe you'll get a trade. Maybe, maybe you'll go to McGill. That's if you're able to go to McGill. Remember, these are microaggressions that students hear. And so what we don't realize is that when you hear these type of microaggressions and then you further gaslight, we've actually caused psychological harm to our students, to our future generation, which enables the value system to maintain itself because we've crushed the next generation and their ability to stand up. Now, I wouldn't say this generation so much. I think this generation is really like, we're getting off the train. There's no snow piercer here. There's no first class here. We don't want this. Because what ends up happening to students is that, and us as well, we start to suffer from what I would call PTSD, but racial PTSD. You start to get a little bit nervous when you enter into your classroom and you see the white professor. Right, A lot of my students at McGill, even high school, are just having me for the first time, a black professor, a black teacher. We're still in these first moments. And so when a teacher who may not be from the BIPOC community is facing students who are from racialized community, they don't realize that they're coming into you with trepidation. They're not sure if you're gonna understand them. They're not sure what value system you're gonna reinforce. And as such, there's that vigilance, there's that apathy. So a lot of times I hear teachers say, I don't know how to reach out to that student. And it, it particularly uh, affects our black boys who at the moment, statistically, by the way, Quebec doesn't keep this data, I keep this data, affects 50%. By grade nine, black boys in Quebec drop out of school. Now the dropout rate in Quebec is about 51%. So at least we're doing better in that sense. 50%, we lose 50% of our black young men in grade nine, something happens there. There becomes a disconnect. And a lot of times it has to do with that apathy. We begin to see the apathy because a lot of our young folks don't want to accept what's being groveled and shuffled at them. But the system is not designed to allow them to create value systems that are equi equitable or a, because we just can we have exams, we have to do this, we have to graduate, you've got to jump the hoops because then, think what I remember what I was saying with Deborah and Sarah was saying, there's a perpetuation of the value system. If you don't pass this Quebec exam, if you don't pass this Quebec French test, if you don't do this math, you don't get a degree, you cannot move on. And then you're subjugated to going to adult, adult night school and so forth, different paths, which is fine if that's what you want. 
But a lot of times the system is set up to perpetuate value systems that just simply don't apply. So what do we do? I'd like to see a lot of equity training for teachers. And I don't mean just equity training, how do I teach this or how do I not say the N-word? A lot of equity training starting with your mind. What are you saying to students? In an ideal world, I would love to free education from the government. This is my ideal wish list. Will it happen? I don't know because they know it's a value train. But I would like to see equity training. I would like students to see any teacher and feel like they can go to that teacher and explain how they feel like a black per as a black person, as an indigenous person, and that teacher say, you know, I don't know how you're feeling, but I can see the pain that it does it, you know, it creates in you, and I'm here to help you and do what I can do. I would love to see that. I would love to sit down with Deborah and say, actually, education is shifting. It's one of these institutions that may not be as bad as we used to be, but we have a government that holds on to its values and its narrative. And to shift that narrative means that we need to shift ourselves and not accept it. That's why parents need to get involved. You need to know your education system. You need to challenge the curriculum. We also need to start creating alternatives to the curriculum that's presented to our students in the classroom. Let students know. On a personal note, my mother educated me in my own history of Nova Scotia. I knew going in as a five-year-old who I was, where I came from, uh, and we weren't slaves. We were enslaved people. We weren't slaves. And there is a difference. That this type of equity education is not yet valued because it's in vis-a-vis -vis direct opposition of the value train that's presented to us in education. And I think I'll just stop it there. So thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for this. Uh, I think uh, if you if you have a look at the chat, people are identifying or relating to what you just said, and and even me personally, I'm just uh, I'm uh, how can I put it, full of hope with uh, with seeing the work that you do and and the realities that you put forth. And uh, as we know, this is the first step towards significant change, right? Having those conversations. So we do have a couple of questions. Uh, so the first question is from uh, Isabel Miller. And her question is, can you please speak to the impact of political leaders telling the populace that there is no systemic racism in the province while workers try to prove cases of systemic racism from their employers before mediators, arbitrators, commissioners, and judges within the province? I mean, I'm a, I'm a political scientist, so I guess let me let me try. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that has a, a, a huge impact. And I think that, um, look, like, how can, how can I explain this? Um, if you're interested in, in knowing the, the history of racism in this country, that leads directly to the door of the state, right? The state has had an unparalleled role in creating and maintaining circumstances of, of racial inequality, of protecting white supremacy, of enacting violence against black and indigenous people. Um, and if you want to get all academic -y and sociological about it, you know, in political science and the other social scientists and sciences, we talk about the state, uh, we define the state as an entity that maintains a monopoly over the legitimate use of force in a given territory, right? That's a Weberian definition, um, which means violence is at the core of the state, right? Uh, and that's, this violence is primarily like demonstrated by, by the police and the military, right? These are the state's coercive violent arms, but not just the, the police and, and, and military, right? Because increasingly the violent arms, the violent nature of the state um, has extended to other policy spheres as well, which is as well, which is why it's possible for us to talk about crimmigration. Right, like the intersection of, of the criminal punishment system, not criminal justice system, y'all, criminal, criminal punishment system and immigration, the foster care system, right? And that the damage that, that child protective services has done to black and indigenous communities, mm -hmm. right? The welfare system, right? And the way that even as it's a program that's premised on, on uh, the redistribution of, of wealth Right, it frequently uses coercive mechanisms to mandate like the surveillance of poor populations, 
right? So, so the thing is, like the, the, the thing when I hear questions like that, or like, you know, what about leaders saying there's no systemic, systemic racism? Like, of course they don't, right? Like, what, what do we expect of the state? Right. We cannot rely on the state for freedom. We cannot rely on the state to, to be our liberation because the state has not been like, it has not had anything to do with liberation. In fact, what we have been trying to liberate ourselves from is like the unequal application of state violence against our communities. Right. And so like, so the, when, when state power behaves as state power always has behaved, we should not be surprised. Right, and this is one of the, the this is one of like the major lessons of, of the of critical race theory is that the state is not neutral. Government institutions are not neutral, right? They are at base designed to protect the racial order, right, and the gendered order and the class order, right? And so like, and so this is part of the reason why why it's you know it is not surprising that the state does what the state's gonna do. Um, uh, which is to say that, like, if there is such a thing as, as liberation and, and emancipation, like, it is us, right? It is us. It is our resistance. Um, it is the ways in which we, we collectively can come together to force the state to, to recognize our demands, right? To respect our identities, to redistribute the, the vastly unequal wealth in this country and others. Right, and to reimagine what democracy looks like, right? This is amazing how much of democracy is inherently undemocratic. Um, it's, it's, it's incredible how much of democracy is undemocratic. Um, and it doesn't have to be this way. We can imagine different worlds. And that is like the beauty of critical race theory. And that is the core of black political thought. So, like, and, you know, and it's, and I know that these things seem impossible, but the thing I want to, I'll end on this too. The thing I want to emphasize to you is like, you know, like the end of slavery in the United States seemed impossible, right? The demise of the British empire seemed impossible right? The Haitian revolution seemed impossible. Like we are an impossible people who have done impossible things, right? And, and so like an end to this world and the beginning of a different one is, is, is not in the realm of impossibility. Thank you for this. Thank you for this. Julie, awesome. Yes, yes, I, I was going to say, Sarah, do you want to jump in? <laughs> sure, just to build on what Deborah was saying, I think um, within the question, the question recognizes that uh, workers and individuals attempt to prove cases of systemic racism before various administrative bodies of the state, while political leaders say that there is no systemic racism in, in Canada. And I just wanted to comment on the role of those state institutions, um, which Deborah kind of opened up the conversation to, to say that yes, people do appeal, of course, to the, uh, these administrative bodies and to the courts to uh, recognize systemic racism, but that does not necessarily lead to transformation in and of itself, right? So the Supreme Court of Canada has recognized time and again that systemic racism exists in Canada. And yet we see within um, the judgments of the Supreme Court of Canada, often the reinforcement of systemic racism within this country. And if I were to provide one example, we might look to the ways in which the Supreme Court has shaped and constructed, again, the social construction, the legal construction, um, the rights of indigenous peoples to lands and uh, use of territory through resources and so on and so forth, right? Uh, so some of you may know that um, treaty rights and other rights for indigenous peoples are recognized under our constitution constitution. Um, they're acknowledged and they're uh, enshrined and have constitutional protection. And at the same time, the Supreme Court of Canada has restricted those rights so that when it comes to a question of rivaling authority over who can say yes or no to a project on Indigenous lands, who has the final say at the end of the day? It's the, it's the crown. Right? meaning the government of Canada or the provinces, they are entitled to say yes or no, and Indigenous people, despite the constitutional recognition of their rights, cannot say no to those projects. There are requirements of process, like consultations, 
that means holding meetings and speaking to people and trying to come to some kind of agreement and compromise and accommodations uh, can be provided and um, the language of accommodations goes hand in hand with multiculturalism in some ways, right? Accommodations are required where we can't actually meet the demands that people are making, but instead we give them some kind of compromise, right? So accom accommodations are required. Um, however, uh, Indigenous people do not have the final say, right? So we have to take a very hard look also at those administrative um, than other agencies of the state that we presume might be a good avenue of, of recourse, but might in effect continue to legitimize and reinforce the dominance of the state, the nation state in having a say over whose values count, whose identities count, whose meaning counts through the language of multiculturalism rights uh, and, and accommodations. Thank you so much for, for the answers. Um, and I know that there are multiple questions, the Q&A. So I was thinking that maybe there were some that you preferred or that you saw that you knew that maybe uh, Deborah or Serena or, or Sarah could answer um, amongst each other. So I'm sure there may be some that you are uh, delighted to see and maybe want to, uh, to ask one another as I will invite you to, uh, to see if there's any question that you'd like to, to ask each other. Uh, I think, Deborah, there was a question for you that we all wanted your definition of racism. I saw that question come up. So, yeah, uh, if you... yeah, it 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 came from my head, <laughs> and so um, and I've I've put in the chat. Um, I think like you know, okay, if you, if you want to cite it, it's in my my book. There's a book that I I wrote was on. It's called the Schematic States on the 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 question the racial questions and categories on the census. Um, but I've also recently written about it in an um, in, in op-ed in the Global Mail that was published last June. Um, I think it's it's called something like my my black ancestors fled. Mm. I, I put it in the the, the answer. Um, but that's where the that's where the definition came from. Um, and it will be in the book that I'm publishing that will be out in 2022. I don't I don't know. Um, so sorry, I know everyone's really into citational practices and I, I, I love you and I appreciate that. Um, um, so, but yeah, that's, those are the, the places where it came from. I see there's a, a, a lot of questions about the microaggression and then denial and what can we do? Sabrina, <laughs> uh, do you have like, Sabrina, do you have uh, like, a, a, a set of, of microaggressions that that your students tell you about, you know, more frequently. Yeah, than I mean, I'm one of those a little. I'm a little bit of those. Um, I'm a person who's in the system to break the system. I made that decision a very long time ago when I became a teacher that uh, I wasn't there to maintain that type of value train. I wanted to be different, and. Uh, one of the things that I did this year actually was ask our kids to do a diversity report card on the school and ask them like, what's your experiences? Um, does, you know, academia, does the administration handle it? How do the teachers handle it? How do you feel valued as a human? Um, you know, because a lot of schools, uh, let's be real here. A lot of schools want to, you know, check off the box, right? Oh, we've done Black History Movement. I don't call it Black History Month anymore, but we've done Black History Movement. Oh, we've talked about Indigenous folks. Okay, check, check, check. So of course we're a di diverse school, but uh, kids tell the truth. Like, I feel like kids tell the truth. So some of the things they've heard is like, well, maybe that college is not for you. Or um, perhaps if you had done this or uh, you know, what, what's the other ones are, uh, you know, uh, you know, why, why, why are you wearing that thing on your head? So they're referring to a do rag. Right. And so this was actually a fight that I got into with the teachers. They were like, well, you know, that thing that they put on their head, I was like a do rag. Mm -hmm. And they're like, yeah, but it, it should come off. Why? Because you perceive them a particular way, but actually it's a hair maintenance. Right. And it was a boy wearing it. So I said, maybe you should ask yourself why you're seeing them in a particular way rather than harassing the boy to take it off. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's a very, it, and, and the truth is it's not necessarily, it's an unconscious bias. It's an unconscious bias. It's a, it's the media. It's, you know, it, it's a lot of uh, images that are, are thrown at us. Like you're saying, Sarah and Deborah, it's, it's a way to maintain the state. Like if people think the state 
are going to give up power, give up their privilege, even though we're discomfort, like we have discomfort, you're delusional, absolutely delusional. Uh, one of the problems that I have with the N-word that people don't realize is that we're asking people to give up a word that is frankly disgusting. However, they want to keep it in the play box. Why? Because it's a way of reinforcing your place. It's a way of reinforcing that you don't have enough power to take that word out of use for me. And that's a problem for me because that comes down to politics. And so uh, other things that I've heard the kids from like, oh, can I use your English name, which really bothers me a lot. Like, no, take your time to learn that student's name correctly. Um, or, and often kids will give in again, it's that authority, right? Kids will give in and say, oh, it's okay, sir. It's okay, miss, call me this. No, I tell them all the time, if I have to pronounce it every day to get it right for 195 school days, that's what we're going to do, right? So it, it's those type of microaggressions when they're encouraged. Luckily at our school, those microaggressions are not too high because we have a diverse staff. You pretty much can see everybody from the globe in our teaching staff, right? But it wasn't always like that. Uh, some of the other things that we hear is like, well, you know, there's always alternative school as if alternative school is a punishment, right? So, oh, we'll just send you to an alternative school. And so I've heard a lot of these things over the years, not just from our students, but students from across the province, students across Canada, where they're in a system that certainly doesn't feel like it suits them. And I think the number one problem is they don't see themselves in the choices of books. They don't see themselves in the choices of the curriculum. They don't see themselves in the school. They don't see themselves in the culture. They, they just don't see themselves as Canadian. And again, we know when the biggest human need that we have is a sense of belonging. And when you're young, this is a massive, they're obsessed with it, right? Obsessed with belonging, the right group, the right Instagram chat. They're just obsessed with it. And so that one moment of micro microaggression or isolation can really change a student's complete life, 100% turn them around in a way that we don't like. So, and then again, then it goes back to Sarah and Deborah, where then we get to criminalize that student, right? Oh, we always knew they were going that way, right? So it, it's a very interesting foundational bad seed planting that we have at school. Very, very, very and it starts with school because that's where you learn the value systems that you need to hold on to in order to make it. Let's be honest, you know, my mom sent me to the right schools to make sure that I could get to McGill. She's not stupid, right? She couldn't send, she sent my brother to the not right schools and we have different career paths, but my mom sent me to the right schools, the schools that had more white folks than black students. You know, I went to the John Abbott's, the Roe West, the McGill's, the right schools right? The schools that would open the prestige. And for those of you who speak French, we know that prestige in English actually means to deceit, to be deceitful. So it's not very prestigious, right? It means to, to be deceitful. But one thing that was also asking in the chat, Julie, was like, what kind of training do we need? Well, first of all, I think that school boards, and I'm calling on all school boards in this province, need to have an equity educator, somebody who is committed to looking at the value systems of school. Like, like Deborah said, the state's not going to give it up. But certainly we're in high school and elementary where you can start challenging it, right? So we can start creating little liberators, whether we like it or not. And then someone asked about what do we do at the university level? Often I try to use a technique called defining, like, oh, what did you mean by that? I was, I'm really Canadian. Do you want to help me out there? Sometimes people will self-correct and like, oh, that's not what I meant. So what did you mean? Other times they'll dig in their heels. And then you have to say, well, actually, you know, what you're doing to me right now is microaggressing and I don't appreciate it. And so it depends on your confidence level. Sometimes you can step up and, and stand next to a person who is being microaggressed and make them feel like they're being supported. Or if somebody is handling themselves, you can step back. Sometimes you need to call it out, right? And a lot of people who feel like, what if I call it out and the person actually doesn't feel offended? The truth is I would rather you call it out and set the tone that what's acceptable than to let the conversation go by because the person said they weren't offended. Because in actuality, maybe they don't feel comfortable enough saying they actually were offended. But again, this goes back to why don't we have equity training? Why did it take Quebec schools so long to put out an anti-Blackness 
um, anti-racism statement. There was only two schools in the province. I'm telling you that statistically, two schools in the province. Why did it take school boards so long to put out statements of anti-racism? Why, anti why are equity statements haven't been improved upon since the 1980s? School systems is where you make, you, it's a Plato's playground. It's where you put people in their place. And I see it so much, so much. So I would like to see, I'm actually planning, Deborah and Sarah, I'm gonna be doing equity education for teachers. I don't know where I'll find the time, but that's what I'm gonna do because it's just, it's not acceptable anymore for me to be a teacher and walk in and say, no, I'm sorry, you wear hijab, you, you can't be a teacher. Or no, I'm sorry, you're black, so you have to go to uh, trade school or, you know, oh, you need history to pass. Like these things are just not acceptable. So I think you wanna break a system, you gotta clog the pipes from inside. I mean, so. I, think that's, I think that's right. And I, I guess my question, um, and, and I'll, let me throw it to Sarah after this. Um, you know, I've always been really skeptical of, of, of equity trainings, like to, to be perfectly honest. And, and part of the reason why is because the, the data we have on implicit bias in the social sciences demonstrates that like you can't train your way out of, of structural racism, right? Like there's a really great article um, in Rolling Stone, believe it or not, by Matt Taibbi. It's called Why Baltimore Blew Up. And uh, it's, it's on Freddie Gray, after Freddie Gray was murdered by the Baltimore Police Department. Um, everyone was talking about like body cams. And, you know, Matt Taibbi says like, we can't put a body cam on a system, right? We can't train our way out of all the ways which, you know, the system is predatory. Um, and I think that like one of the interesting things that happened after, you know, George Floyd's murder in 2020 was like everyone wanted, like diversity trainings were like the thing, right? Like that was like the, the thing that people wanted. And like, you know, I am the guilty as charged, right? I did, I did a bunch of them. I tried to, to make them more radical because my job is always to make little radical people. Um, but like, I, I, it worries me so much when we see, um, take universities, for example, universities seek to install like chief diversity officers. When, you know, I just spent 10 years working in institutions of higher education in the US where chief diversity officers ended up being like glorified fundraisers, right? So what, you know, so like, what, what do we do, right? Like, like, what, I don't know, Sarah, and Sarah, I'm interested in, in, in what you think, because like there's, there's so much wrong with the criminal punishment system, right? Like people talk about policing and defunding the police and yes, we should, absolutely. But um, defunding the police is not gonna do anything about overcharging. Yeah. It's not gonna, you know, it's not gonna do anything. The definition of crime. Like, Right, the definition. Um, lawyering, uh, trespass. It's not going to do anything about the fact that the special investigations unit in Toronto and Ontario is, you know, is is made up of former cops, right? So, so what do you? I don't know, Sarah. Like, what do you see as? Yeah, that's such a such a wonderful question, and that's what I think about all the time, <laughs> and what I teach. And I th I think part of what you're pointing towards is a tension between working within the system and working without, or working against the system, right? So internal versus external of transformation. Um, and another way to frame that is to think about reform versus radicalism, right? So reform, if we're talking about body cams in the policing context, if we're thinking about sentencing, right? So we have rules around sentencing of um, Indigenous people who've been found to be guilty, or actually those rules tend to apply when the person has pleaded guilty. So that's an issue in and of itself, because it requires people to plead guilty before they're given any kind of leniency. Um, and those rules are now applying um, as well to Black people who've been uh, found to be guilty. But there is this tension, right? How do we continue to push forward and work within the existing system while trying to create some kind of transformation that requires so much more? Um, and in the context of equity, I think um, myself as a Black woman, um, I find myself right in the middle of that tension. And I don't know if it's, you know, an oscillation between being cynical and then having faith, or I just inhabit a kind of uncomfortable position where I can hold both the potential that, equ that equity and diversity initiatives and so on can potentially achieve something with my skepticism and my commitment to external community service and scholarship that's focused on more radical forms of transformation, including teaching students about that very tension. 
Um, I mean, I, I agree with you. I'm quite skeptical of um, a lot of equity and diversity initiatives that movements like BLM uh, tend to repudiate, right? Tend to repudiate the possibility for internal reforms. Uh, Sarah Ahmed is a scholar who's done a lot of excellent empirical work on documenting how ineffective uh, equity and diversity offices have been in uh, the United right. Kingdom. My and laptop was exactly in that book. <laughs> or we might think about Rosalind Hampton and her book on McGill University, right, in Montreal. We might think of Ronaldo Walcott, who's written an excellent article called The End of Diversity that addresses this question of um, equal opportunity, multiculturalism, diversity, all as a kind of interacting discourse that does not necessarily achieve the kind of justice that we might uh, want to see. And um, we might even think that populating institutions with individuals on an ad hoc basis, for instance, through hiring, through initiatives to get racialized students into the universities and so on and so forth, again, can kind of legitimize, legitimize the status quo, right? But at the same time, I sit on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission Committee for my university, and I sit on the Diversity and Equity Committee, and I feel a real responsibility to do so. Um, and I'm engaged on those committees in trying to further change as much as I can within the context of my everyday life and the relationships that I have with people who are around me in my engagement with students, right, in providing them with moral support, providing them with emotional support, and also supporting their initiatives to try to place pressure on the administration within universities. I'm here talking about the Black Law Students Associations, the Indigenous Law Students Associations, who've done amazing things, right? Um, if we think back to the history of CRT, it was students and allied professors who pushed things forward within their institution and created a social movement that's had enormous resonance over the course of, of time. So I suppose for me, you know, I share your, your cynicism, but at the same time, I do feel that uh, social transformation is a bit of a process of, of, of groping, right? We're grasping, we don't really know exactly how it takes place. And so for me, it's a kind of all hands on deck a proposition in the way that I live in my daily life, while I still maintain that kind of healthy skepticism in my back pocket that allows me to be reflective constantly about, you know, whether it is, uh, whether what I'm doing will actually achieve change or, or not. I think there's one definition that Dorothy Roberts um, builds on in a, in a piece that she wrote recently called Abolition Constitutional and constitutionalism in the Harvard Law Review, where she uh, talks about um, anti-reformist reforms. And what she means there is that we shouldn't undertake reforms or other types of action, internal action through diversity and equity and initiatives and so on and so forth, in so far as they reinforce the status quo. But we can undertake reforms that are incremental, um, that are internal, as long as you know they whittle away in some way um, and move us towards our ultimate goal. And in her case, she's talking about abolition. Right? She's not just talking about defunding the police, but is actually talking about the abolition of the system of incarceration in, in the United States. How we distinguish between basic reforms that reinforce the status quo and anti-reformist reforms is kind of anyone's guess. You know, we might say that we can do that through social science research in retrospect, um, but when we're moving through our daily lives, I think it's a little bit of a leap of faith and we form opinions about whether something's going to be effective or not. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't have anything more to offer in that respect in terms of an answer, but it's just to say for myself, I kind of embrace that tension um, and try to inhabit both worlds at once because um, I feel the responsibility to work within my own capacity, right? And the institutions that I, that I work within um, and the people who I interact with. What do you think, Sabrina? I actually am really happy to hear from both of you because I think 
a lot of these buzzwords come out, right? Authentic, diversity, equity. And I think I always think about what is sustainable, right? I, I, when I work with clients, I always tell them, I don't want to work with you if you're not doing the work in the dark and you're only doing the work in the light. Like if you're doing it for check mark purposes, or if you're just doing this as a one-time thing, there are other people I can refer to you who can do the check mark and the one-time thing. Um, I actually do consider myself quite radical, Deborah. It's, it's really funny, but yeah. radical in the way that Sarah is mentioning it. Like I'm in a system that I think is inherently rotten, but I also know I'm in that system and that I do serve my purpose in the system as a black teacher who's been in the system for 20 years and students do see me as a brave and safe persona. And so I think that's my act of radicalism yeah, yeah. I think so. Rena, I'm not going to throw stones in the glass house. I'm literally at McGill right no, now. No, so. <laughs> no. no you both of you just gave me a lot to think about. I realized that I really like to do in radical internal equity work. Like I'm very much about, um, I've grown a lot more, I guess those, uh, those trigger words, confrontational Black women at work. I, I, I went to work in September and said, if you might go arrest me, you're getting it. I straight out told my peers this at school. If you say something stupid to me, then you are going to get something stupid back. Like, whereas last year or maybe the year before, I would have been like, okay. But then George Floyd was murdered. And someone in our staff meeting said, well, why are people out there protesting when we had COVID? And it was silent. No one said something. And I actually said, why are you talking about my life as though it doesn't matter? Right. And I realized why, like, like, like Deborah says, why am I waiting for people to stand up for myself? My ancestors didn't do that. I'll do that myself. And I think it's also the reason in a more um, visual manner why I shaved my head. I was like, you know what? I know there's this connotation around bald black women and I was really afraid to do it, but I almost feel like I'm here. And if you're going to microgress me, you're going to get it back now. Like there's no more allowing my students. I always tell my students, you've got to navigate a certain way and you know how that teacher is. I'm gaslighting them. I'm doing that by telling them, you know, stay within your realms. No, no, no. Now I tell them, listen, you have a problem. We will use, and I'm going to be very clear with this webinar. You use the ways that they know against them to get what you need. I tell students this all the time. You use the language, you use the value system, you use the tools that are employed against you to get what you need. So you have to go and use what's available to you. And a lot of students, I feel like a lot of folks, for example, um, always want to do something different, but I think it's about using your own, the own, your own game against you. That's what I guess I'm trying to say. And that's what, I'm, that's what I've been trying to teach the students. You got to know that system inside out. I never looked at McGill as a privilege. For me, McGill was my right to go. It was a university in Montreal I was going. I, I'm always telling students, you want those scholarships, do those internships, go to a black organization, volunteer, get those letters. Use the system that wants to keep you in your place to break your place and start blocking those pipes. So I, in some ways, the bo both of you have helped me realize that I'm, an, I'm a radical internal pipe breaker. Like I'm not interested in um, like voting the status quo anymore. I'm tenured, I'm happy, take me and take me as I am. And if you don't like it, don't talk to me. It's just that simple, don't talk to me at school. If you're not down with my value system, if you're not down with like undoing uh, the oppression that is put on me, then don't talk to me and don't harm my students in the process. And, uh, yeah. I think so, um, Julie, unless you have a question that you want us to move on to. No, okay. So I think like that actually dovetails really well with a question that just kind of popped up in the chat yeah. about like, how do we as women of, of color, as black women, uh, yeah. because don't say people of color when you mean black, as black women, like how do we navigate these spaces that are so toxic and so, um, you know, full of microaggressions and, and gaslighting, like what, like and, and so I I am I want to pose this to Sabrina and Sarah, but I also want to say for me like like this like this, this did not I did not get here without a lot of trauma like like I did not get here like without like 
you know, at one point hiring a lawyer to sue an institution. Like I did not get here without people sabotaging my career. Right. So like, you know, the, the, the fact that I am here is not like, because like I, I persevered or anything like that. It's like, it, it's, it's something, you know, like every black person I know has a story of professional sabotage, right? Every single black person I know has a story of professional sabotage, especially in the academy. I'm sure it's even worse in like the dynastic like world of, of the legal profession, right? So, um, you know, what, I guess to, to Sarah and Sabrina, like, do, like, do you have any, any, any strategy? And Sabrina is just like, to, like, right now seems to be like, okay, which I appreciate. But it wasn't um, always that. And it wasn't always that, right? No. Because here's the thing, because, you know, it's like, like 10 years ago when Cheryl Sandberg, right, super rich white, rich white lady, CEO of Facebook came out with the concept of lean in, I was so mad because mm -hmm. like leaning in is not possible for all no. of us, you know, yeah. right? Because we are not like perceived to be lean, to be leaning in. We are perceived as being like threatening, yeah. right? Yeah. And exactly. when we lean in and when we are then like pushed from behind and we don't have the same safety nets to catch us when we fall, right? Yeah, yeah and this is what I mean by like, seemingly universalistic rules uh, that different populations differently. I think before I was a black cape girl and I'll tell you what I consider the black cape. Um, you know, my mom used to always tell me you behave a certain way outside and when you come indoors, you do it, you take off your black cape and you be you. And so there's this understanding that you never really bring your full self to work when you're black. Mm -hmm. That's it, you don't bring your full self. And I've had many situations, like you said, you know, we all have our war wounds, like you're saying, Deborah, of situations we've gone through and you really, really wanted to put that person in your place, but you know you're black. So if you get toned up a little bit too much, you were gonna get called in. So we've all had those moments. And, you know, I realized what was happening is that I was almost giving the same gruel to my students and I like passing on the black cake as, as if it's a protection. And it was on some level, it is a form of protection, like mind your P's and Q's, you know, make sure you're always keeping calm. But to be honest, that's a form of self-imprisonment, right? Mm -hmm. It is a form of, it's not authentic. And I think it's really funny. I, I hate to give Quebec any kudos, but when Bill 21 came out, Quebec just blew my mind. And something just triggered me so deep that it no longer became sustainable to black cape it. Because, yeah, you know, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but my dad is Muslim, my mom is Christian. I was raised in both faiths, say what you want, raised in both ethnicities, understand my heritage. But there's something fundamentally I'm proud of as a teacher, and I'm proud to tell my students, you essentially can do what you want when you want, and you can do it. But when you start taking away my right to tell my students that they can be anything they want in so-called Canada, it triggered something massive for me with Bill 21. It just triggers an anger that I could not, un I could not hold back that a government was systematically uh, legalizing the discrimination of rights in, in a form of self-protectionism. Don't get mistaken. That's not the obvious mistake that I don't understand Quebec history. I very much understand where this is coming from. It doesn't mean that I can't disagree with it. So I think that triggered me a lot, Deborah, when you started taking a right from a future generation, something in me that that person at home was like, we're not doing this anymore. And they had to be combined. The person at home, the activists and the teacher and all the personalities came together. I was no longer, it was no longer sustainable to be fragmented anymore. Um, I, I can't pass on that, that illness to my students and that's what it is it's an illness to think that you got to stay in your place you got to mind your p's and q's you got to watch yourself because there's a system that doesn't value me i like i said i've had many stories where i'm at the mall and the kids are getting harassed by the cops and they call me in and the cops don't give two shits about me and the kids are like but miss you're a teacher you're a dr jeffrey and when they see that that it, i'm reduced to the skin the color of my skin it, it was too much. So Bill 21, it actually Quebec brought up that radical part of me because I was like, no, I'm not, I'm not doing this. And I've said it all the time. Quebec is not a sustainable province for people of color, for ra ra racialized people, because 
there, there, there's a there's an identity issue in Quebec. Quebec doesn't know who they are as a province, as a people, and so they will do everything they can to protect themselves at the expense of myself. And for me, that's not sustainable. So now, yeah, I'm in that like, come at me, do what you want, be small, yeah. we're gonna fight. Like <laughs> that's just I'm what it is. Similar place, I suppose. You know, I have yeah. in the legal profession. Yes, I mean it's not written testimony about being black on Bay Street or being black in law firms and you know I quit jobs I've quit jobs I've moved between the academy and and practice um, and doing law reform internationally and that's because I was jostled around and I and I and I left because I felt like it was um, too detrimental to my to my mental health um, and so it was a a move of self-preservation, not an empowering move at all, to have to quit and have to leave or to have to do things differently, um, but self-preservation. But I think over time, um, I found myself in a place where I can, it's not leaning in, you know, I don't like that language either, but there is a sense in which I feel like I can bring myself um, in an honest way to my work in teaching um, my students. And that really feels liberating to me you know even when I began teaching in law schools I think there's a standard at least in some law schools of the kind of entertaining uh, white male professor who stands up at the front of the class and makes jokes and gets people on board and professors fear in evaluations that you might be said to be boring right or that what you're teaching is dry you know, and I think a lot of that has to do with this expectation of the performer, the entertainer, teacher. And I realized at a certain point that I just couldn't do that. Like, I couldn't do that as a black woman. I could not be an entertainer because it's different for me to be an entertainer than it is for a white man to be an entertainer at the front of the class. And what's more, it does a disservice to students because what happens when you're teaching criminal law and you're making jokes at the top, the front of the class? about when you're talking horrendous things that have happened to people or you're talking about the social context that leads people to do things that we consider to be horrendous um, and you know I've learned from emulating other people so mentorship has always been an important part of that kind of growth and I did not have mentorship for a long time you know, the fact of the matter is, is because there aren't Black women in my field in the academy, or there are very few, that, you know, that kind of mentorship has been inaccessible. But making allies with people who are like-minded um, has been important, as well as seeking out support from people who may be far away, but who you can communicate with by telephone or however, to share experiences and and think about strategies um, to move forward and this kind of move towards emulation figuring out what other people in my position have done in the past has been something that's very important to me you know i didn't used to wear my hair down when i worked as as a lawyer if i went into a courtroom i would put it back in a bun um, but i think it's really important to uh, be honest and to be myself, especially around young people when they're learning. And, you know, I have issues around politics of representation as well. I don't know that just, again, as we've said before, populating institutions is, is the ultimate solution. But at the same time, I think in our daily interactions with people, there's something really um, transformative in being, you're being oneself, right, and not trying to hide behind these um, externally imposed uh, ways of, of acting that are, that are a form of self-harm and, and um, that potentially harm others around you because you're reinforcing that over and over again. I, I want to pick up on something that Sarah just mentioned, and that is the role of, of allies and, and advocates and mentors and, and other, other folks. And there was a question in either the Q&A or the chat about, about um, you know, what, what can white folks do? And, he, and you know, here's where I wanna draw like a, a, a really careful distinction um, uh, between like white allies and advocates 
who like in my life have 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 saved me in in a number of ways hands 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 down i would not have a phd were it not for joe cairns who is a is maybe retired uh, was a professor at the university of toronto who like single-handedly made sure i was admitted to the program because he thought my research was worthwhile and and no one else in that department did right like and then i won a bunch of awards and then they all did right but like so so you know i have had white advocates and and white allies there have, there's a long history of white allies there have always been white abolitionists right there have always been white people who you know who have fought along black alongside black rebellions john brown right there have always been um white anti-colonial you know, you know advocates there have been were white people in the civil rights movement there are white people fighting against like apartheid in south africa right there have always been white allies there's a long history of white allies um and in in some ways as well the the social construction of race that sarah talked about emerged as like it emerged as a concept that was designed to provide what Du Bois called the psychological and material wages of whiteness, right? So race emerges as a concept in part to ensure that white people will not ally themselves with at the time free free black folks in the US and and, and uh, enslaved black folks who were who were trying to rebel against the colonial elite. Um, so like that for the side. Uh, so there have always been white allies. <clears throat> On the other hand, there's also way more white liberals. And like, beware the white liberal, right? Uh, you probably know them, you've probably met them. I used to want to be them, right? The white liberals who are progressive in, in name and not deed, right? Who, uh, who virtue signal, right who are invested in, in moral credentialing but like a will not give up power right um that will not change anything right the your your white friend who will not confront their friend that thinks it's okay for them to say the n-word because they don't want to like you know make that person feel bad and this is the difference i think in my life it has been like white liberals claim to be progressive right they want to have good politics, but when you dig a little deeper, what they're scared of is being confused with white conservatives. That's why when Trump was elected, they wore safety pins, right? Because they were scared that people would think they're the wrong kind of white people, right? And on the other hand, you have white allies and advocates and accomplices, I think some language is being used now. And in my life, those have been the people who have actually given up power, who have put their reputations on the line for me right like you know the power give, concedes nothing without a fight Fred, frederick Douglass said right and, and the people who have who have like mattered who have made a difference to my life have like you know taken on labor for me um you know because they know that i do a lot of invisible labor they have spoken up when it was when it was to their detriment to protect me they have put themselves in harm's way for me Right. And so if, if, if the people out there who are watching who want to know how to be a good ally, like you need to, to do you need to to do something, you need to give up something. Right. Because we as as black folk have a lot every day. We sacrifice a lot every day in the name of this democracy. Right. And when white people have been asked to sacrifice in the name of this democracy, in the name of bringing black folk into the democracy, they either have not done so, or they have met that sacrifice with a disproportionate backlash that frequently involved like extra legal entities like the KKK to, to punish black people for, for daring to be, to claim personhood, right? So like, don't be that, don't be a liberal white person, right? Be a, be a, a white ally or a white advocate. Um, and it's, it's a harder road, but, uh, you know, for those people who want to make a difference, I think that's the, that's it. That's the only, that's the only road there is. I think part of that too, Deborah, is that you have to become an ally, right? So as you said, it's not just a mentality, it's a doing, but it's also not claiming for yourself that you are an ally. Mm -hmm. You can be recognized as an ally and brought <laughs> in as an ally by black and indigenous communities. But thinking of oneself as an ally 
is the start of a problem. So if you're already thinking of yourself <laughs> as I am an ally, then it's time to reflect very deeply on, you know, your own self image and who you're actually allying with and who considers you to be an ally, right? Because it's a process of becoming and it's a process of action and it's a process of exception. Again, I talked about Mary Matsuda at the beginning of this talk and looking to marginalized people for, for solutions, right? Those who are at the top cannot claim that in order to become an ally, to know what it means to be an ally and to be recognized through doing rather than as an identity stat status, right? It's not an identity politics to be, to be an ally. It's a mode of, of acting and a mode of, of living in relation to other people around us. I think too, like, so the thing that I get from my students and like I, you know, I have taught at predominantly white institutions for my entire career, um, some more predominantly white than others. And the thing that I get from my students, my, and my, my, like my classes, I teach the politics of race and my classes are mostly white, white folks, right? The thing I get from my students is that they want to, like they want to do good and they just like are unprepared or don't know how or don't know where to start or don't have the vocabulary, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> and, you know, attending like this kind of thing is, is the beginning, right? Because like the more that you, are able to access that vocabulary like right away like the bolder you will be really you know and and, and it's just it's, it's like anything else like it takes practice right it's like writing it's like running it's like it's like anything worth doing takes practice right and so and and being like an, an ally and advocate working towards racial justice also takes practice as well right so like when you're at a party and some white people are singing along to jay-z and say the n-word so you're like not shell-shocked right so that you're you can like immediately be like that's not okay dude like and, and, and you know and then have that conversation right and that just like that preparation it is like it's stuff that you that you can do on your own i think i put in the chat i, I teach a course on black lives matter like the the syllabus is online my syllabi are online like you know it's you know we can we can recommend readings it's like this stuff is is not i have a, a list of books here that i'm reading right like um like prepare you know prepare yourself to to, to do this work and it will come, it'll come easier i think also an important point that you mentioned both of you is also knowing how to recover like even if you're making a mistake and you're practicing, I know one thing that allies get or allies in the making get really worried about or they don't attempt to do it because they're afraid if they step in that intellectual doo-doo, right? They, they, they tend to come, like they tend to regress back and, and they get shy again. But I would rather you make those mistakes and learn how to recover from it and say, I'm, I'm learning, you know, I'm learning. Essentially, I'm learning. And I think having a recovery and knowing that it's okay to make those mistakes and recover back and, and you know, you're good. Like we, we want you to do the work. Um, there's many of us who are in the work ourselves who have made mistakes and had to recover and had to get called out and go through the process and, and learn. And, and my mind has changed so much in this process as a person experiences. So if you're an ally in the making, then I think also understanding not to be so hard on yourself, self-care, ally recovering these are important things and important for us as well right on the screen like recovery every time i do a session like this it's important for us to come off and recover self-care for our spirit because we're, we're giving something here but it's all equally important for white folks who want to become allies or just non-white non-racialized people that you do have a recovery process you do have a self-care process and take care of yourself because it's not easy for us so we're giving you the heads up that it's not easy. So those are really, really important tools to have and, and keep practicing. You make the mistake, you know, you brush it off, get up and you do it again. And that's gonna make the difference in, you know, changing the system and, and moving it forward. Absolutely, it takes courage, right? It takes real courage and um, the understanding that you may make mistakes. On that note, um, I would suggest that there are different kinds of mistakes that can be made. 
And uh, Tracy Lindbergh, who's a professor at uh, the University of Ottawa, talks about kind mistakes as a particular type of mistake, right? And kind mistakes are mistakes um, where a person is already informed. A person has gone out and done the research to try to inform themselves about whatever it is that they may be addressing, you know, reading through the resources that Deborah's referred to, not necessarily relying on Black people to provide those resources to you, but actually going out and searching, you know, and, and reaching out for yourself so that you can come to a conversation as educated as you possibly can be before making a, a mistake. Um, and of course, mistakes should also be well-intentioned. Right. So uh, it's not uh, productive for anyone if those mistakes are not uh, well-intentioned or not um, informed to, to begin with. But we also have to still recognize that mistakes can cause harm. And so there has to be something about self-care, but also a kind of collective recovery for the kind of harm that mistakes can entail. And the fact that they are kind mistakes do not, does not necessarily alleviate the harm that those mistakes do. Right? So again, it's a kind of uneasy or an uncomfortable tension that's not necessarily reconcilable, but it is a collective process insofar as we're talking about allyship and there has to be space for that kind of discomfort and the recognition that it's uneasy, that it's a hard thing, that it's difficult. And this attention that Sabrina was talking about in terms of you know, thinking about our emotions and recognizing them and being able to take care of ourselves because it's very difficult work uh, ahead. All right, well, um, I'm, I'm not sure if you had any follow-up questions, but it was so wonderful to just follow the, the train of thoughts for your conversation. And my apologies for my little one behind. I think he doesn't want to go to sleep. Um, <laughs> he's probably cheering you on as well. Um, maybe we have the time for one last question. Um, and then after we will close off uh, maybe with, uh, with, with your parting words. Um, um, there was one that I saw that was uh, very interesting. Or is there one, is there, was there a question that was, that was really speaking to you? Or you want to let me choose? I think you can go ahead and choose, Julie. <laughs> okay, no problem. <laughs> All right. Um, and now this is where I'm going to be losing it. Uh, it won't be long. We have so many, so many questions here. It's, uh, it, it's really wonderful. Yes. So it was a question by um, Wanda. Kagan, I hope I'm saying it right. Um, the question is, I was wondering as there has been exposure that there definitely is systemic racism in Quebec, are you hopeful that change will come, especially as you mentioned, Canada abolished slavery much later than other countries and is still constantly denying that we have systemic racism, at least in Quebec? Mm -hmm. um, That's a good mm -hmm. one, eh, Deborah? That's a good one. I know, I hate it when people ask if I'm hopeful. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, like, I, I, I hate it when people ask if, I, when I'm, if I'm hopeful, in part because, like, on the one hand, on the one hand, the protests that we saw last summer were empirically, right? I'm a social scientist, so I can talk about empirics, right? Empirically, the most diverse we've ever seen, the largest we've ever seen, I mean, ever in North America. The largest we've, we've ever seen, uh, the, the, more, the most sustained we've ever seen. Uh, and in terms of the public opinion data on, uh, public opinion data on uh, Americans, we don't have any in, the, in Canada, of course, but American support of Black Lives Matter, um, you know, the public opinion data just like rose astronomically. Like, there's a bigger spike in support for Black Lives Matter in the two weeks following George Floyd's murder than there had been in the previous two years, right? So the protests that we saw last summer were hope inducing, um, in part because that that has been the first time that we have seen white folks en masse come out to support racial justice. I'm not joking. Like you look back at the, the, the marches of, of, of Dr. King, 
look back at the early Black Lives Matter marches, like in, in 2014, 2015, that was Black folks, right? That was, that was, you know, there were not white people, in, in large amounts, numbers of white people in those. Um, and so we saw, we saw something that was substantially different, right? And so that in and of itself is significant. That in and of itself like gives me, gives me, you know, some optimism. On the other hand, windows of opportunity have happened before. They are always temporary. We, and we've already seen retrenchment, right? Mm -hmm. So we saw that, um, you know, the, the proposals to defund the police go before Toronto City Council and it gives more money to the police, right? We've seen proposals to defund the police in major American cities, um, like over 50 American cities and Minneapolis, like at the heart, the core of these protests couldn't get it done, right? So, um, and so like these moments are, temp are, are one, are temporary, and two, systemic racism is huge, 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 right? Like, so one of the exercises I do with, with my class is um, we map out on the board, like the various components of the criminal punishment system, right? So like policing, the courts, for like, and including prosecutions, incarceration, and then like, you know, uh, rehabilitate afterwards, right? And I, I got my student, I get my students to talk about like all the various elements that they think are, are systemically racist, right? And then this is a context in the context of American politics. So like peremptory strikes on juries, like judicial bias, sentencing guidelines, like mandatory minimums, three strikes, um, what the fourth amendment and the way cops have used it to deflect responsibility when they commit homicide, right? Like, and by the end of the exercise, the board is filled and the, the point of the exercise is that defunding the police will not solve, right, the rampant systemic racism in the criminal punishment system. And that's just one system that leaves alone healthcare, that leaves alone education, that leaves alone welfare, that leaves alone immigration, that leaves alone all the challenges facing indigenous people, get the land back, right? So, so like these problems are not small and they are, will not be fixed like easily. They will not be fixed quickly. They require sustained direct attention. And I do not think our politicians are up to that task, right? So that's like, that's my answer to, to that question is like, on the one hand, things seem like, and, and things do seem like they're changing. Like, look, like when I was doing my PhD 15 years ago, <laughs> right? Like. One, nobody thought my research was, was worthwhile, right? Like somebody once told me at the University of Toronto in a job talk that there was nothing new, interesting or original about my research at all, right? Two, there was no, like people were not talking about white privilege. People did not know what that meant, right? right. And, yet, and now I have students who like, who, who they may not know like the, the substance Right? They, they might need me to help them navigate like the, the wealth of literature on this topic, but they at least have, starting, have a starting point. And that was not the case 15 years ago when I was the only black PhD student at the University of Toronto's Department of Political Science out of a cohort of 150, right? I was the, I was the, first, black, I was the first PhD student to write a dissertation on race in that department in the year, year of our Lord 2010, right? So like things, I, you know, things seem like they're changing, but like it's, it's slow, you know, it's slow and it's gonna, it's gonna take, it's gonna, we gotta, you know, it's gonna take a fight. The language of hope um, myself. Um, because it can seem a bit passive, I suppose, um, whereas I'm committed to action and I have a sense of responsibility. And so I don't tend to reflect on, you know, are things going to change? Are they not going to change? I just want to do. Um, and I don't feel that I cannot do, you know, it's, it's just a part of who I am because I am a Black woman and I have a responsibility to do this for myself and to do it this for other black people, right? So I'm not sure that hope um, captures my own ethic um, of care, 
but that said, I know there are people who are inspired by the idea of hope and I, and I think that's great as well. And I think it's a discourse and it's a way of thinking that can be mobilizing and that can be very inspiring and, and helpful. I suppose, you know, in thinking about will things change, the question will things change, um, you know, we've talked about changes over the course of our discussion. We've talked about how revolutionary the abolition of slavery was, right? Although, of course, slavery has its afterlives and has various permutations that continue into the present day, whether it was through many of the things that Deborah traced in terms of the segregation of uh, Black people in the education system in Canada, whether it's through policing and incarceration, whether it's through labor, you know, we see all these different permutations of the afterlives of slavery in the present day. But we are all also here speaking to you, right? Um, which I think is really important. We're sp here speaking to you and you're here engaging with us and you're listening to us and you're interested and proactive. And I think that's so important to, to recognize again in a sense of daily life, right? How we're creating the right relations between people who are, who are around us and the kinds of uh, privilege and opportunity that we do now have in in some cases, even if those opportunities are um, a deviation from the status quo, um, we cannot minimize just how important they are to, to individuals and to the potential for transformation. There's a much longer conversation that I think we could have about how transformation would take place or what hope means in the context of racial capitalism because we're not just talking about racism as an ideology and systemic racism as something that kind of exists out there, right? But um, capitalism has always been racist. It's always been based on the creation of um, difference between people and whether that's based on class or gender or race, you know, it is really implicit in capitalist systems. And there's a radical kind of transformation that needs to take place for systemic racism to be dismantled among other forms of, of oppression. Again, that's a much longer conversation, uh, but fundamentally what we're talking about are different ways in which people are subjugated and oppressed and dispossessed to the benefit of a few to the benefit of some, right? Um, and that's a conversation that really does need to take place if we are thinking seriously about how to dismantle systemic racism because otherwise it might just assume other permutations and other technical forms as it has done uh, to date while still acknowledging of course that there are these leaps and these are exceptions to, to the status quo. Um, so hope, I think, is a wonderful concept and it can be inspiring. Um, I'm not sure if I have hope. It's not that I don't have hope. It's just not something that I really consider because I think much more about, you know, what actions I can take to try to promote transformation in my lifetime among the people who are around me and uh, hopefully also, hopefully also into, into the future. Sabrina, I don't know if you wanted to add something. Mm, I, I, I think I'm more along the lines of both Sarah and Deborah. I, what comes up in my head is proceed with caution. Um, I don't think I have the opportunity to feel hopeful or optimistic. I think um, I'm so entrenched in doing the work. And I think like Sarah says, I believe in the planting analogy, like I'm planting seeds and, and hoping that uh, they'll be nurtured and they'll they'll grow and and I guess that's the really that's the deep little teacher in me that's always looking um, to pass it on as a legacy. Um, you know, one thing that worries me, I think Deborah touched on it so eloquently, is that I don't want this to be trendy and and this is what I get worried about, right? I get worried about this work and this movement being trendy because we're not trendy, like we're here and I we have to live through this. So. Uh, my concerns, I'm always looking, I'll be honest, I am cautious, I'm always looking for the diversion, like what will come up in the media that will try to divert our attention from this work. So I guess I, I'm a, I, there's a little Deborah in me because I'm always like, I'm waiting, I'm waiting to see what the diversion and I thought this is going to be very unpopular, but 
I thought the diversion was coming. There was an opportunity to, to divert us when you know that the, the shooting and the killing in Atlanta happened, and our Asian brothers and sisters were under attack by a man. And you, but again, we we collaborated. And so the diversion wasn't successful. And I was really happy to see that black folks were supporting Asian folks in the Asian community and that indigenous and black folks are collaborating. And so there's a very powerful picture that I have on my phone where, you know, people were supporting Huey, you know, Huey Newton for the Black Panthers and they were Chinese and they were writing it in Mandarin and in Chinese. So I, I was very concerned that this was going to be a diversion done by mainstream media to try to draw our attentions from, you know, our, our struggle in our movement. But I'm really happy to see that we, we, we recognized it. We saw the fastball coming and we said, oh, hold on a second. Not only are we stop Asian violence, we, we stop oppression violence. And so that made me cautiously optimistic, but I have to be honest, I don't think I have the, I don't have the ability to feel what I'm doing. Like I have to lay seeds down I have to leave a legacy. And I'm hoping that people don't forget that it's only been a year that we watched a man lose his life. And, and, and we had to get to that point where we're all in COVID, we were all in a situation and people had to be humanly shamed and see the life of another person get drawn out of them before they became, before they became activated, right? So and then we know psychology tells us that humans, like people from groups don't like to see members of their group shame them. And so I'm not, I don't want to say, and there've been people after George Floyd, let's be real, right? And we still haven't reconciled things here. You know, we had Mr. Matthew Sheffield who was shot by the police here in Montreal, a mentally ill man, right? We had Michelle Kamara who was arrested. So it hasn't changed. So I don't think I have the privilege of feeling if I'm honest, I have work to do and um, it never stops. And that's why it goes back to what Sarah was saying. If you wanna be an ally, you have to understand the work never stops. Like it never stops. There's not one moment that I'm not gonna come off this call and deal with some other garbage that we have to deal with in order to deal with. So uh, it, it's, it's hard for me to say optimistic or hopeful. I'm just a doer. I'm a planter, I'm a sower, I'm a doer. But I am, I am proud of us for avoiding that curveball because I, I was very like, okay, let's see, let's see. <laughs> and, and, and I love the fact that we're beginning to see, I don't know if Sarah would, Deborah would agree, but I'm, lo I'm loving this, these indigenous, Asian, black co you know, collaborations happening where we're seeing what you know, mainstream media or mainstream value systems are trying to throw at us and we're recognizing it and we're making a decision to do to move away from it and to collaborate and to come together. So maybe that's what I'm optimistic and happy about. I will give my opportunity to feel that because that made me really proud. Like that made me really proud. Um, but I don't know if I have more time to feel like I just do. I think I, I agree with that. I just do. Uh, half of the time I don't, yeah, I just do. It's just work after work. Thank you so much for this. Oh, uh, Deborah, you wanted to mentioned something I, I saw you are we doing our, our end I wanted to say yes. something really, really quickly yes go ahead go ahead as we're ending okay so as we're ending thanks to Montreal on action for for having us um Sarah and Sabrina always a pleasure um I wanted to like tell people who are still watching that like everything that like at least I said um very much like like Sarah and that like I never had a black teacher like ever right in, in in you know 13 years of the Ontario school system and 10 years of post-secondary education never like laid eyes on a black professor um and so like I learned everything that I just said I learned it all and if I learned it you can too and so I just want to say really quickly things that I'm reading right now until we are free is by uh the the activists of yay of Black Lives Matter Canada uh in their own words um uh, speaking of what Sarah said, Manning Marbles, How Capitalism Underdeveloped Black America is classic if you want to know what racial capitalism is. Um, I haven't started this yet, but I'm super excited about Harsha Walia's Border and Rule. Yay, right? Rosalie Hampton's Black Racialization Resistance at an Elite University is about McGill specifically. Um, Catherine McKittrick is like the smartest person. 
that she's just brilliant. Um, she's at Queen's University. She wrote this book called Dear Science. It is astounding. Um, Richard Eiten was on my committee. He passed away a few years ago. He is the, the most, the smartest person that I ever knew. And he wrote this book called In Search of the Black Fantastic. It changed my life. Um, so read it if you can. And of course, I am never with that. I literally carry James Baldwin around with me the fire next time. So um, I know that was really, really fast, but uh, those are the, the things chat. that I'm reading right now. I put it in the chat. Oh, and thank you. Looking forward yeah. so as good. the stories, uh, how racialization takes place, Black oppression and subjugation as well. Deborah referred to freedom dreams, right? So you can read the work of people such as Robin Kelly. Um, who tracks kind of black radical traditions and black radical imaginaries. And then in the Canadian context, we have David Austin, um, who's written a number of books, Fear of a Black Nation, right? And many other books that specifically talk about Montreal context. Um, so there those are two other suggestions about um, positive change as well as uh, I have it here somewhere, but Robin Maynard's Policing Black Lives, right? A wonderful a book about the history of Canada, um, as well as how things might change in, in the future through direct action and allyship. Thank and you I put so those much. in the chat for us as oh, well. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much for this. I saw this. I was like, okay, I need to. I need to make notes. Yeah, <laughs> take notes. actually, it's 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 really great because I'm actually going to be the moderator for Dave Austin tomorrow in a conversation with Austin and college and how their faculty can um, diversify and look at the curriculum. So for those of you who are interested, that's coming up tomorrow. I'll be yours truly will be moderating and Dave Austin will be speaking and um, Shana, Shana Hill from New York, they'll be talking about things. So uh, yeah, I'm just trying to, can I send the books? I only know the books that I saw just now. <laughs> I can't remember it's all, them all. It's all good. We, we will compile them yeah. um, and, uh, and we'll make sure that it's available for everyone. But I really want to say thank you once again. I know we went a little bit over time, but listening to you all was really inspiring. I think you can see uh, uh, people really related to the conversation. The conversation is much needed, really fantastic. So thank you so much to the three of you. Um, I'm looking forward to, to listening to you more again in future opportunities. Mm -hmm. And now I will uh, pass it on to Nadej. Yes, thank you, Julie. And just to add to what you said, thank you, uh, Deborah, Sarah, and Dr. Jeff Rowley. It was a pleasure to have you. And I think we'll have to invite you again because uh, we all want to listen to you <laughs> talk more. So we'll try to do that again uh, in the near future. So thanks again. And thank you to everyone who asked questions and was here uh, tonight with us. Um, just want to also let you know that uh, as part of the Action Week Against Racism, we have uh, two more webinars. We have one next Tuesday that Balarama, our founder, is having with Brian Bronfman, who is the co-founder and president of the Network for Peace and Social Harmony. And they will be discussing many themes such as uh, peace, anti-racism, and inclusion. So that's next Tuesday at 11 a.m. And to close the week, uh, the Action Weeks Against Racism, we have our third webinar on Wednesday, March 31st at 6 p.m. with James Oscar and Raven Spiritos. And they will be discussing uh, how systemic racism is, uh, shows up in the art and culture sector. So you can all, you can register to that through our website. Uh, we'll be promoting those webinar in the coming days. Um, and yes, yeah, so just so you know, we're on social media. We have our website, moralmaxon.com. We have Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, so you can follow us and share our content. And do not hesitate to comment on our publication or slide in our DMs and uh, let us know what you think. If you have questions, any comments, we're always happy to uh, talk with you. And we also have a GoFundMe if you're able to give a couple of bucks. It'll be really appreciated because every penny counts and help us accomplish uh, that mission that we're all fighting together. So thanks again to everyone who showed up and hopefully we'll see you next week uh, during our next webinar. And thanks to our three speakers and to Julie. Have a good night.
Thanks, everyone.